Hello, and welcome to episode two of Talk Julia. My name is David Amos. And I'm Randy Davila. Randy, I have been absolutely blown away by the response we've gotten to creating this, this podcast from the Julia community. I'm not sure what your thoughts are on that, but I, I just... It's pretty surprising. Yeah, I was not expecting uh, to get that much uh, traction, I think, after you know one, one episode just introducing ourselves. So uh, I, before we kick this off, I just want to say thanks to the Julia community for being so incredibly welcoming and uh, it's, it's really inspiring and really, you know, firing us up for, uh, for getting this podcast out and, and doing this on a weekly basis. So it's super cool. I just felt a lot of love and felt very welcomed by them. Well, let's, uh, let's get into it. So I'm learning Julia for the very first time. Randy already has some experience with it, um, but uh, a lot of the stuff we're going to be talking about today is, uh, I think, kind of beginner-oriented content, um, as well as some, some news. So uh, let's just jump straight into it. Uh, the first thing I want to share is this really awesome article I found by uh, Trang Le, which is 10 Things I Love About Julia. So Trang wrote this from the perspective of someone who uh, has an R background, uh, which is not my background. I come from a Python background, but there's still a lot of really cool things that I learned from reading the article. She talks about how she used Julia, uh, this would be last year now, we're in 2022, but for the 2021 Advent of Code puzzles. Uh, so Advent of Code is, they, they do this every December, uh, a bunch of code puzzles, you can solve it in any language. And uh, this for this year or for last year, uh, Trang did, did it all in Julia. And she lists three, sorry, lists 10 things here that she loves about Julia that she learned while she was doing it. First one being the great packages. And uh, she mentioned some of the packages uh, that she frequently used for solving the admin of code puzzles. So things like chain, combinatorics, linear algebra, primes, statistics, graphs, which is a nice thing to see in there. Um, and the data frames and so on. Things like broadcasting, she mentions how R performs element-wise operations automatically, but in Julia, you have to specify that by, by using the, uh, this little dot uh, after a function name or before a symbol in order to do uh, like the, the broadcasting uh, type stuff. So it's kind of the same thing in Python. Normally things would be like element-wise, but uh, if you use something like pandas in Python, then you get this broadcasting uh, kind of by, by default. Uh, so that was a nice thing to see. This one was a new one for me. I, I wasn't aware that Julia had a splat operator, although it makes sense that it would have something like that. So that's the little ellipsis, the three dots. So for example, using it in a function definition, uh, it's, she says it indicates that the function accepts an arbitrary number of arguments. So you could do something like this uh, in Python by using the star args in your in your function definition. So it's similar to that. Uh, but then also well, it's like unpacking, right? Yeah. And then also kind of unpacking. So there's the star operator in Python that if you put it, for example, before a list, it will unpack that list uh, and give you each of the values in the list separately. Like like if you have a, a function that that accepts any number of arguments as opposed to like a a list or vector or something like that, you would unpack that list in the function call so that it would use each element of the list as an argument to the function. Here you would add this splat operator to the end of the list uh, to do something similar in, in Julia. She mentions the Unicord, Unicode support, which is, I think, Nothing. Something, <laughs> yeah, something I really like. And like you mentioned in episode one, how it's just helpful to be able to sort of translate from, say, like an equation you're looking at in a textbook to uh, to code uh, in Julia. <laughs> this literally, like when I was learning um, some of the basic machine uh, machine learning algorithms on my own, I literally could type the exact same thing from the textbook into Julia using Unicode, and it worked. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that is pretty neat. It, well, it's, it's a nice quick way to just do that translation. As it, it just kind of fits a little bit easier in your in your mind, and uh, you don't have to do so much. There's not, not so much overhead, right, of, of making that translation from right. uh, text into, uh, into code. One of my uh, favorite, uh, not to interrupt, but I just have to mention this, that... Yeah. Um, 
one of my favorites is the union and uh, intersect operators uh, in Julia for sets. So if you're familiar with Unicode and, or familiar with WaveTech and you like the union of two sets is the element, like the set containing all the elements in, 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 two, in both of the sets. If you do backslash CUP, so cup and press tab, mm -hmm. you get the union operator. And if you have a set and you do union operator set, it does exactly what you would think. It is the union of those. The same thing with the intersection. It's just, I remember that distinctly as being one very cool aspect when I first started playing around with Julia. So yeah. Yeah, it is cool. And I like how easy it is. Like you, you mentioned, you just, you sort of type in, in, in a lot of cases, it's the same thing as, as what you would type in LaTeX. Uh, and then you hit tab and you get the, the nice Unicode representation of that. So uh, very cool. I like that feature a lot. The macros, which is something I'm going to be diving into a lot, uh, understanding, you know, how those work and, and uh, what those are, but uh, they're just functions. <laughs> Yeah, sure. No, I know. But uh, she mentioned some of the, the macros that she uses frequently. So this uh, at show, at chain, at time, at assert, these things. And uh, scope, the way scope works in Julia. So this is something uh, I'm going to have to understand uh, more as I as I dig deeper into Julia. But it looks like maybe it's a little bit different than a lot of other languages. So you have to be very explicit about where you want variables to be defined. And she says, in general, it's best practice to indicate whether a variable name is global or local within your loops. And she gives an example of using that global keyword inside of a loop. And that's something that I think, you know, as a Python mainly a Python developer, that's going to be, uh, it's just going to feel icky <laughs> every time I do that. Yeah, I wanted your opinion about this because I saw this earlier today. So um, right now you can't see our screens. We're looking at a for loop with indexing with I. So for I equals one to 10, do some stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So your I is your variable for your, your for loop here, right? Yeah. But if you have I somewhere else defined in your code, you can increment that I by doing global I plus equals one if you wanted to increment it. So when you type that, it's not the I in the loop, it's the I that's somewhere in your, your code. The right. global thing that like it made me like pause for a moment and I, I didn't just I didn't know what your opinion was to that. Well, I mean, I think in that case, it would be better to just use a different variable name. Like you already have an I somewhere, you know, don't use that for the, the variable that you're uh, looping over you're incrementing in your for loop. But I just thought it was interesting that in Python, there's really kind of a stigma associated with this global keyword. I mean, sometimes you have to use it. You have to have a really good reason to use that. Uh, in Julia, it's, it appears to be a little bit different. So that's something I'm going to have to just a habit and, and maybe a, a preconceived um, bias or something towards something like that, that I'm going to have to get over. But that was uh, interesting. So and kind of pointing out to me, okay, there's I, I really need to dive deep into how scope works to make sure that I really understand uh, how that is how that's working in Julia, as opposed to something like Python, which I'm more familiar with. She talks about uh, find and filter and compares it to R, which uses this uh, which function. So so she says that Julia's find all function is, is, is essentially R's which function with slightly longer syntax. And then if you want to get the elements instead of positions, right? So find all the, this Julia function, uh, you have some condition that you're checking for inside of maybe a, a, a vector or a, some you know, matrix or, or something. And it's going to return the positions of the elements that meet that condition, which is which can be really useful. But if you want the actual values, then you use this filter function. So that's a good thing to uh, to be aware of. David, do you know what the so on the screen you can see inside of this filter function a variable uh, dash pointing at another variable? Do you know what that is? With, with what's going on there? So we have I do a, not actually. That's an anonymous function. So just like in it is okay. Like that, yeah, that so would have been my guess, yeah. So in Python, you have like lambda, lambda functions to do mm -hmm. like quick um, function calls inside of other functions. Um, in Julia, we have this like, what would you call that? Pointy thing? Like, <laughs> A right arrow? I don't know. <laughs> right arrow. So like, if you have like variable, right arrow, and then you can do variable assignments. So it's like an anonymous function in Julia. Yeah. So I've seen that same kind of syntax in JavaScript before. Actually, I think it's the, exactly the same kind of thing. And when I saw it in JavaScript, I, I really liked it because it sort of reminds me of how we might write it in mathematics, right? If you have a function, uh, say, that takes x and maps it to, you know, x squared, you could write it as x. And then you do the little right arrow with like the little 
uh, cross on, on the front of it uh, to, you know, X squared or something. So I, I, I like that notation a lot. I think that's that's kind of nice. Yeah, yeah. I, just looking at this code, it's so Julia code. And I, I wish that everyone could see it. It's just we have the right arrow, right arrow in there, which is the anonymous function. But then also in the variable, there's a little subscript I, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> which you can get a subscript by doing underscore, like backslash underscore, I think, or something like this. Yeah, backslash but, underscore tab. Yep. Yeah, so it's, again, this like Unicode stuff we were talking about earlier that just looks very mathy. Right, yeah. Then she talks about simultaneous assignments, which is nice. And that's something I'm very familiar with coming from Python. So that's nice to know that that is going to work pretty much as expected coming to the, you know, coming from Python into Julia there. Memoization is easy. You've got this memoize macro, uh, which is which is really cool. Never heard of it in my life. Uh, so you can sort of think of it in a, in a sense of kind of caching values, right, from the, the function call. So the so there's like this recursive function. So the example, it, it's got this function called my recursive func. And when you call this recursive function, uh, so think about, for example, maybe the, uh, the Fibonacci sequence, right? So the nth Fibonacci number is the sum of the two previous ones, right? N minus one and uh, N minus two. And when you expand that out, when you say, okay, I want to compute maybe the the fifth Fibonacci number. So that's the fourth Fibonacci Fibonacci number plus the third Fibonacci number. Well, the fourth Fibonacci Fibonacci number is the third Fibonacci number and the plus the second Fibonacci number. But now you've got like two times already that you've had the third Fibonacci number appear in like if you're expanding out that computation. So with memoization, what it'll do is it'll compute that third Fibonacci number. And then anytime else it appears in that expansion, it'll use like this cached value that it got for computing it uh, once. So it's not going to, you're not going to have to repeat those computations over and over again in that expansion. So that's kind of what this recursive function is doing is kind of expanding that out, right? For you, if, if you, if you're thinking about the Fibonacci sequence. Uh, so yeah, memoization is a really powerful tool to, you know, to speed up and, and get a better uh, performance out of uh, something that's recursive. So that's nice to know that, that it's just easy to to do there. And she has some additional neat things that she mentions, a bunch of different useful functions that she came across. There's a lot here that, that you know, I'll be, I'll be looking at and, and comparing to my own knowledge. She mentions things like uh, the collect function, which turns an object into a collection. It's sort of like using this list function in Python. There's a zip function in Julia that uh, she says is is uh, comparable to the zip function in Python and uh, all sorts of stuff here. So, you know, I saw this uh, on Twitter and uh, when I pulled it up, I just was like, okay, this is really cool because as someone who's just starting their journey into Julia, there was a lot of questions that were already answered for me just by reading uh, this this article. So yeah, great job, Trang. Uh, thanks for writing this. And uh, you've also inspired me to do uh, advent of code uh, this year in 2022, when it comes around in December, to do it all in Julia as well. So, Randy, what uh, what have you got? The first thing I want to talk about is the Julia REPL. So, when you install Julia and you open up the little icon, the first thing that you'll encounter is the REPL, and it is very similar to the Python REPL in that you can do simple computations, you can define functions, uh, you can have print statements, you can program only using the REPL. And when you start off, I really do suggest that you play around with it for at least like 10, 20 minutes before you try to maybe use an IDE. Yeah. How do, so David, you have taught many different lessons on Python or written about learning Python. How yeah. did you, like for people learning Python with the Python REPL, why did you suggest to them that they use that first before using an IDE, or did you? Oh, I, I, yeah, I did. Uh, to start with the REPL, just just because it's so quick. I mean, you can you can just open it up, you can quickly get a feel for how it works, what it looks like. But the other thing too is, and this really I think mainly applies to people who who have never programmed before. The terminal can be kind of scary, and by kind of starting them off in the uh, Python REPL or in the Julia REPL, uh, it sort of demystifies, I think, some of that and, and sort of helps you overcome some of that anxiety of like just looking at, oh, I'm in this command line thing, am I going to break anything if I if I make a mistake? You know what I mean? So uh, that's kind of why I like starting with the REPL, but also just, you know, to, to really get a, 
uh, a quick feel for the language uh, to check that it's installed correctly and working, you know, those, those kinds of things. Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely agree. Because you can open it up and you, you know nothing about, uh, about Julia, you can just type like one plus one, press enter and you see something happen. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, that's another thing, the quick feedback, you know, just being able to, okay, I did something and you immediately see the result uh, as opposed to, okay, I've typed it in, now I have to run it, do I, how do I do that? Is there like a button I have to press my, you know, so it's just, it's so much quicker, uh, you get that instant feedback from a REPL, so. Right, and um, the Julie REPL has extra stuff. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and these are called the modes of uh, the Julia REPL, and there are I think five of them, four of which I'll, I'll talk about briefly here. Um, right now we're in the Julian mode, so this is just straightforward computation, an instant feedback on what you're writing. You can write functions that I mentioned earlier, define variables, all sorts of things. So as you're learning Julia, you might want help with things. The Julia REPL has a nice mode called the help mode. And to enter into that mode, just type a question mark and you'll see uh, on the bottom of your screen or the left hand portion of your screen, you'll see help. So all you have to do is type the question mark and it says help. And then you can pass in, you can type out anything you want to learn about as far as like items that occur in Julia. So like functions, constants, things like that. So for example, if I wanted to know uh, about the uh, time macro, so I just type the at symbol, time, press enter, and then I get a, a long list of information about this at time macro. Yeah. Um, which is kind of nice. And it's really well documented. It's, it's, uh, it's impressive how, how much time and effort uh, the developers of Julia put into the documentation of the base Julia functions, the things that are here. It's just, there's so much that you can learn about. Um, and I think um, it's, I, I learned a second ago that if you don't put anything in there and you just press enter after hitting the question mark, you get like a bunch of possible search items. A lot of them are Unicode as, as, as uh, David was talking about earlier. And then we get uh, links to documentation and then links to uh, uh, tutorials and learning resources, which is really cool. Yeah, super cool. So definitely, if you see a function and you don't know how it works, um, as you're in your learning Julia journey, open up the REPL, hit the question mark, type the function out, press enter and see what it says, All right? Um, so that's the help mode. Next up, I probably the most important mode is the package mode. So Julia has a rich ecosystem of packages for all sorts of things like machine learning, data science, scientific computation, like uh, numerical analysis type of techniques, uh, and even game development, as I saw recently. To access these, these Julia packages, you can open up the REPL and then hit the right square bracket. As soon as you hit that right square bracket, you're going to enter into package mode, and you'll see a little PKG on the, the, in your terminal. So um, PKG is the Julia package manager. So when I started programming in Julia, um, before Julia 1.0 came out, you used to have to install packages using capital P and then lowercase kg, the PKG package manager. So um, this was just how you did it. After Julia 1.0 came out, the REPL started having this built-in functionality to access that package manager in this package mode. So suppose I want to add the package Pluto, I would just type in add uh, capital P L U T O. So that's the name of the package Pluto and I'd press enter. And now, uh, this version of, of Julia that I have will have access to this Pluto package. Now, if you wanted to, uh, maybe add the Julia kernel for Jupyter notebooks, you would just do add, um, I Julia. And I know many of you out there might want that one word of caution though. Um, after you add these packages in the package manager, they might not appear the way that you want to. So it's, I've had experiences in the past where I've used the package manager to add the Julia kernel so that I can work with Julia in uh, Jupyter Notebooks. I go open my Jupyter Notebooks and I don't see that kernel available. If that happens to you, you probably need to build the package that you installed. 
So inside of the package manager, just type something like build and then the name of uh, the package you want to build. Uh, and that has resolved all the problems I've ever encountered with packages not appearing the way or not working the way that I thought they should work. Um, to exit out of the package mode, just press uh, delete for backspace and you'll go back into the Julian mode. Okay, so super, super important to know about. And um, we'll have links to uh, uh, a few resources on learning the REPL uh, when we post this. Oh, I almost forgot. The mode that I think David would enjoy the most, and that is uh, the shell mode. So to enter into, to enter into the shell mode, uh, just hit the semicolon button, and now you'll see it says shell. This is equivalent to your computer's terminal. So um, if you're on a Unix-based system like Mac OS or Linux, you can type ls, press enter, and that'll list all the directories or the folders in your current working directory. Um, I forget the, the command for Windows, but there, there's all sorts of, of, of terminal or shell commands you, should, you can learn yeah. and you should learn. Um, actually, real fast, David, how important do you think it is for uh, people to learn shell commands, learn their terminal, and get acquainted with it? I think it's very important. Um... You know, if if you're just starting out learning programming, I wouldn't focus on it too much at the beginning. But in my mind, to be a productive developer, you you just there's so many productivity enhancing things that you get out of learning to to work effectively in a shell. So it's it's uh, I would say it's pretty important. Yeah, I I I've found that it's important to know the directory that you're in and to to quickly be able to like see the hidden files that are there. Yeah. Um, I'm like, I, I can't tell you how many times I've just been, why is this not loading? I know that I have access to this package somewhere. And then I have to open up the terminal and I see the exact path where it's at on my computer. And like, oh, I'm, I'm not accessing that directory. Right. Right. Um, but yeah, so any of the, the, the commands that you look up for using a terminal on your machine are going to work in shell mode. You can just navigate through your, your directories. Um, yeah. And um, it's, it's just really nice. So uh, I guess that's what I had to say on the REPL. Uh, David, what do you have next? Yeah, well, just a couple of quick comments on the Julia REPL. So it's really nice. It's a little bit more, has a few more features than say the Python REPL does. One thing that's kind of nice about it is these uh, the the highlighting the coloring uh, that that comes with it you know standard uh, the Python just the you know the basic Python REPL or Python shell that you get when you install Python doesn't have any of, of that so it's all just you know white text or whatever you know you've you've set your terminal uh, text color to be uh, so that's cool the help mode is awesome Python has that as well. Uh, in their their basic shell, and and I use that all the time in Python. It's very similar uh, to the way it works in in Julia, so that's super useful. the The package thing is definitely kind of a new thing, well, new to me anyway. That you know is a big difference from Python. And then the shell thing that you know the basic Python shell is great, but I find myself working in something like IPython a lot more, and IPython has that shell functionality, so you can do the exclamation point followed by a shell command, and that'll run it in your shell instead of, uh, you know, as, as like a, a Python command. So it's nice to see that built into the, uh, to just the, the REPL that you get when you install Julia, because that is something that can be very annoying. Uh, and I apologize, my neighbor's dog has decided to join our, our conversation. <laughs> but uh, that is something that can be kind of annoying if you, if you find yourself, you know, having to do things both in the Julia REPL and then also in your shell. If you don't have that shell function uh, or that shell mode, then you end up with, you know, having to have two different uh, terminal windows or terminal tabs uh, open and you're kind of going back and forth between those. So it's really nice to just be able to drop down into that quickly do what you need to do and then uh, get back out of it and get back to your uh, Julia. So I like that a lot. Yeah. So the next topic I wanted to talk about is uh, an article I found on freecodecamp.org, uh, which is a really fantastic website for learning to program. I think it's the very first article that 
features Julia on the on the website. So FreeCodeCamp for a long time has had you know JavaScript and Python and uh, and more, but uh, it looks like they just published. This is December 29th of 2021. Their first article on Julia, and it's called "Learn Julia for Beginners." And I I came across it again on Twitter. It's written by Logan Kilpatrick, which is the Julia community manager. And it looks like Free Code Camp is looking to add a lot more Julia content to the website in the coming year and years uh, moving forward. So that's super exciting to see. The article itself is really nice. It's kind of a short introduction to Julia. So it just goes over, you know, again, if, if you're coming to Julia from another language, uh, this would be a really great resource just to kind of, uh, you know, compare, you know, it's, it just covers the basics, you know, how to create a variable, um, how to, uh, you know, introduction to some of the types in Julia and maybe some of the differences there and uh, how to write conditional statements. So doing, you know, Boolean logic and conditional statements and that kind of stuff. Uh, so that's, you know, like the if if statements and if blocks and that stuff. Uh, how to use loops in Julia. I think it talks about both while and for loops. Yes, it does. And uh, how to use functions. So how to write your own function in Julia and then use it. Uh, it talks about you know writing functions that can take arguments, uh, that kind of stuff. Um, and it also covers uh, packages in Julia. So what you talked a little bit about when you're talking about the REPL, it talks about how to enter that package mode uh, and, and use the package manager in the REPL by typing that right square bracket. Uh, and it covers how to add packages, how to remove a package, and how to check uh, what you've already got installed. So very helpful tutorial. Uh, just to kind of quickly get started, oh, it also talks about structs, um, which are kind of right your your custom types. Uh, it mentions that you know Julia does not have object oriented programming paradigms built into it, uh, which I think for a lot of people coming to Julia from another language, that's going to be a pretty significant change, right? So uh, so it mentions that and it talks about structs, how you create them, how you use them. Uh, all that kind of stuff. So uh, yeah, I just found it was, you know, a really nice quick read. I was able to just kind of browse through it and really quickly get some of the questions I had in my mind answered. And then it's got links to a bunch of additional resources to to learn and, and, and go forward uh, with that. So I really liked it, uh, especially for just how, you know, it was kind of short and sweet, like here's just the absolute basics of what you need to know to kind of get started uh, and then point you out into a, another direction. Uh, so Logan, great work on that. Um, and I'm excited to see more Julia resources popping up on a free code camp. I'm excited too. And again, as we were kind of mentioning in our last podcast, I think 2021 is going to be a lot of growth. 2022. <laughs> yeah, 22. <laughs> I know I'm still making that adjustment in my mind too. <laughs> So one quick thing before you you take off with your next uh, topic, Randy, I just wanted to mention something that was really amazing, a huge goal that Free Code Camp has. Uh, I saw them announce this on Twitter. Uh, they're not there yet, but their goal over the next maybe decade or so is to offer a free accredited bachelor's degree in computer science uh, available to anyone anywhere in the world that has an internet connection. Uh, that yeah, it literally costs no money, and you can it be accredited by a U.S. Uh, institution, and you would come away out of that with an actual bachelor's degree in computer science. And I think that's really that, awesome. I did not I know. Think that. It's amazing, and I really hope they can they can pull this off. So there's an article written by Quincy Larson, who is I think the founder and, and CEO uh, of a Free Code Camp. And he talks about, you know, why they're they're they've got this goal, and his kind of the main reason behind it is, you know, a lot of social mobility is still locked up in university degrees. So there, there has been a trend in tech as of late, I'd say over the last few years, where they're they're sort of loosening their degree requirements, but mainly for entry level positions. If you want, a you know, a high paying job in tech, you're still you need a, a four-year degree at least 
uh, to get those kinds of jobs or maybe lots and lots of experience. So, uh, you know, but that's a huge hurdle for a lot of folks. Um, and if they can pull this off, I just think this would be a huge, a, oh, yeah. a huge deal. And so I, I really support them in this, this effort. And, you know, they talk about kind of their financial goals and how they, you know, think they, they can get there and everything, but, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll share a link to this article uh, in the show notes for this, but yeah, really, I just, I was just really blown away. I'm, I'm just happy to see that they're taking this approach and, uh, and want to get this, you know, actual bachelor's degree of science uh, in more people's uh, hands. All right. So what, what's your next topic, Randy? For my next topic, I want to uh, briefly tell you about uh, a video by Derek Bannis on YouTube. Uh, it's called Julia Tutorial. There'll be links uh, available. And this video was one of the first YouTube videos that I came across years ago when I started learning Julia early on um, that really helped me coming from a background of already knowing a little bit of, of programming. So prior to picking up Julia, I had done a research using C++ and then from C++, I went to Python, all self-taught using YouTube videos, and Derek Vanis has helped me the entire way. <laughs> um, he helped me learn C++ when I first started, then Python, and then later Julia. And I think for those of you coming from a background of knowing some programming languages, watching this one hour long video will really jumpstart you into the, the Julia programming mindset. And uh, I just, I can't recommend it enough. And if you're just generally um, in, interested in programming, data science and learning, his channel is awesome. So if you're bored and you wanna just watch videos about programming and things like that, I really recommend his channel. But back to Julia, um, this one tutorial I think will be really useful. Uh, David, did you watch it earlier, the whole thing, or did you watch bits of it? I didn't watch the full hour, but I watched, I think, maybe the first 15 to 20 minutes or so. And uh, yeah, I mean, it moves really fast. Uh, it's, pretty, it's a very fast-paced video. So it's definitely not like, hey, I've never programmed before. I want to learn Julia. Probably not the right video for you. But <laughs> like, yeah, like Randy said, if, if you're an experienced programmer coming to Julia from another language, it was, yeah, it was a really nice uh, just kind of introduction. Like here, I'm just going to show you kind of how things work. And, uh, and, and then, you know, you can jump off from there. So yeah, I thought it was good. He's got a nice kind of dry sense of humor too, that I thought was, uh, oh, yeah. it was good. Yeah. <laughs> It's very dry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so there'll be a link for this video provided, and uh, I just wanted to mention it. So that's my my second point. David, what else do you got? Yeah, so the next thing I wanted to mention is a resource that I found in the Julia Docs that uh, is, I think, really, really helpful. Again, kind of the theme of this uh, episode has been, you know, coming to Julia from another programming language. And there is a whole section of the docs called noteworthy differences from other languages. And this is a really nice thing to see. Uh, it covers uh, MATLAB, R, Python, C and C++, and uh, even common Lisp, which uh, I was a little yeah, I just thought it was interesting that that was that was in there. So yeah, if, if you are a Lisp programmer and want to to uh, check out Julia. There's a whole section here you can you can look. But uh, you know the one I'm most interested in, obviously, is is a uh, Python. Uh, but it's just a whole list of kind of key differences, notable differences. Uh, and again, this just going through this answered a lot of questions I had. So it, it's it's just nice that there's uh, these resources out there. Uh, some big things that stood out to me. Uh, one, I already knew that arrays and strings and everything in in julia are one based index uh, as opposed to zero based index which you know python and, and a lot of other languages use normally you know that i think that's a that can be a really hard hurdle to get over if you're so used to a zero based stuff you're just constantly <laughs> going to be thinking in that and you're going to end up with uh either some errors or some you know off by one uh errors and things like that uh my very first professional programming job used uh lua uh i'm not sure if you've ever have, have you heard of lua randy no no idea <laughs> so it's a it's a really tiny little language uh really 
nice language, actually. I really enjoyed uh, using it. And it actually shares, there's there's some similarities between Lua and, and Julia. So Lua is not for scientific computing or, or anything like that. You know, it, it's uh, it's really more for automation, I would say, is, is, or at least that's what I was using it for. I, I know a lot of other people that uh, use it. Uh, I know a guy uh, that I worked with uh, at Real Python, primarily was a C++ programmer, and he was uh, writing uh, code that was running on like security cameras, and they were using Lua uh, to, to do some stuff on the security camera itself, because it's such a small language, you can install it on, you know, a small uh, small chip with not a lot of memory, but anyway, so Lua is one, you know, uses the one based index as well. So that's something that, you know, there's going to be a lot of muscle memory for me that I'll have to get over, but it won't be the first, you know, one based index language that I've, uh, that I've used also, you know, very notable, notable difference for me. Strings are, uh, double quotes in Julia, oh, yeah. double, double quotes, uh, and single quotes, uh, are used for characters. Uh, right. So, which, you know, Python doesn't have a character type every, it's just a string. And in Python, a lot of people like to use single quotes for strings, and that is not going to work for you in, uh, in Julia, you're going to have to use the double quotes, uh, for strings. So that also the string concatenation being done with the, the star, the asterisk instead of the plus sign, like in Python. So uh, I don't know, there's just a lot, a lot of stuff. This really was, you know, just a nice thing to see in the documentation that there's already kind of, hey, uh, we realize a lot of people are coming to Julia from other languages and we want to help you get on board as quickly as possible. And that they just have this there uh, for you. And it really covers a lot of sort of like the top questions I had, and even things that weren't questions, because I probably would have assumed that it would have worked the same way in Julia as it would in Python and most other languages I've programmed. But it's in here like, hey, you're probably going to think it works this way, but actually it doesn't. And, and uh, we want you to be aware of that. So really fantastic resource. Very happy to see that in the docs. And I'll pro I've got it bookmarked and I'm sure I'll be <laughs> going back to it a lot. I like that there's little bits of C programming in Julia. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, like characters are with single quotes in C. Right. right. Also, um, this this little guide here is awesome. And it reminded me when you were talking of this cheat sheet that um, I used to have with me when I would teach. So um, as I mentioned in the first episode, I'm, a, I'm an assistant professor of data science at University of Houston downtown um, and adjunct professor at Rice University. And um, I teach using Python and Julia. Um, I haven't used Julia in the previous semesters, but there was a time when I was doing Python and Julia at the same time. I would just forget syntax all the time, especially dealing with like matrix operations. A lot of the courses I teach are, are mathematics related. So David, if you pull up that link I just sent you in the chat, there is a cheat sheet that we'll have a link to um, that I used to, to carry around with me because I would just forget syntax. And it's just an equivalence between MATLAB, Python, and Julia for uh, vectors and matrix operations. And it's super useful. And oh, um, cool. I hope that uh, y'all make use of it um, when you get the link, because I literally had it printed out on paper and I would have it in my notes when I would lecture, um, just because it's, it's really easy when you're programming in, in two, three different languages to forget syntax mid-lecture. And it's always embarrassing when I... <laughs> <laughs> have like a brain fart as I'm talking and <laughs> yeah. this is like my safety, my safety sheet. <laughs> yeah, that's super cool. We'll definitely include this link in the show notes so people can, can check it out. All right. Um, uh, so that, uh, that leaves you with, uh, with the last topic to cover, Randy, what, what do you got for us? Okay. So, um, last up we have the plots.jl package that I wanted to talk about. From what I understand, this package is the go-to base the base plotting package in Julia. There are other plotting packages, other visualization packages, but plots.jl is the first one that you should start with. It's akin to starting with uh, matplotlib in Python, I would assume. Okay. Now, um, I love this package. The reason is, um, well, it, when I started uh, teaching machine learning, I started with Julia. And I would look at the books and just think what would be the easiest thing to easiest way to plot. And I would import this package and just type plot and then throw a function in there. And then magically it would just spit out a nice looking figure. This is not the case in Python. Yeah. 
So when I transitioned uh, to using solely um, Python for my machine learning courses, like just recently, because I felt that I had to, I had to learn how to plot using Python. It's not that easy. You can't just do like matplotlib dot py plot and then do plot a function. It doesn't work right. That, right. You need to provide it pairs of information, which I get now, but at the time I was so frustrated because in Julia, you import uh, plots.jl and then you can just literally type like plot and then throw in a function and run it and it's going to spit out a nice looking plot immediately. Right. Yeah. Right. Like, so I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing. I just know that I liked it at first and it was easy for me to get used to. <laughs> Right. Um, yeah. David, how do you feel about it? Having pairs versus just a single function? Well, no, I, I like I like this. Um, it's it's nice to be able to plot something very quickly. Uh, and I know that, you know, this plot function, you can provide more information, right? Like you can say, you know, yeah, you provide a range for the X and Y axes and things like that. But uh, but I do like that you can just sort of, yeah, all it needs is the function. It'll pick some defaults. I don't really know how it, how it decides to pick those defaults, but, uh, but it, you know, but it will, and you'll get this thing very quickly. And, you know, matplotlib in Python was really designed to be very familiar for people coming from MATLAB and, and used to plotting in that's MATLAB. I've read yeah. That. So that's why the, you know, matplotlib kind of works the way it does uh, there. Um, whereas this seems to be kind of a different approach. It's not the MATLAB style. Uh, kind of thing. It, it reminds me actually a lot of, so there's a package in Python, Python called SymPy, S-Y-M-P-Y. It's the symbolic, uh, doing symbolic mathematics. It's a computer algebra system. Um, and I know Julia has its own uh, symbolic uh, computation package as well, but uh, there's a plot function in SymPy that works very much the way this plot function uh, works. And it's really nice. I, I like having that like you said, just being able to, I just want to plot, you know, a parabola and you just right. give it the function and there, there you go. Like you, that's it. it easy of, done. Yeah. Well, for all of you instructors out there, this is awesome. So yeah. when I teach on my calculus courses, like Cal one or Cal two, um, I'll just pull up a Jupyter notebook with Julia installed and I'll start plotting the functions that we're trying to learn about. It's super easy to also stack plots on top of each other using plots.jl. Now, this is something that I don't know if David's familiar with yet, but um, so David, have you seen the bang exclamation mark operator with respect to functions? I've yet? seen it. I've seen it. Um, I'm not 100% sure uh, what it does yet. So teach me. <laughs> okay, so this is this is related to plots.jl, but it's more general in Julia. If you see a function that has an exclamation mark on it, it's changing the the object that you're looking at. It's not returning a new one. Okay, so in, it implies like mutation, basically. Is, yeah, yeah, I think yeah. that's the, the, the correct way to say this. So like, if I have like two functions that I want to plot at the same time, I can just call the plot function with the first one, and okay. then I can modify that figure by doing plot bang, plot exclamation mark, and then throw in the next one. And this will overlay. So if, if you if you think about the first time you called the plot function without the bang, it makes like a figure. And sure. then you want to change that figure, you add the 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 bang. Okay, yeah, very cool. Yeah. So it's super easy to just start layering really nice looking figure, um, not layering, piecing together really nice looking figures by just plotting something and then plot bang or scatter bang is like the other operation. If you wanted to scatter data points, uh, you just type scatter and it, it will. Oh, cool. Together. Yeah. Um, and then you could just, you could start updating little things. Like if you wanted to like, label the x-axis after you've already plotted your lines you could just call your your plot bang and you're going to modify the figure you've made and just say like x label and then change it to be like kind of time or something whatever um and that should uh change the figure that you're working with yeah right? yeah um, 
and just yeah that's really cool slowly build it together and i think it's awesome it's just as easy if not easier to use than something like matplotlib yeah that's super cool i like it yeah i you know something like matplotlib is it's a very powerful plotting package uh and you can make very high quality visualizations with it but you know while if you're teaching you want to be able to do things very quickly and matplotlib right. might not suit those needs very well so yeah if you're teaching and and not even just teaching like julia but if you're teaching mathematics or teaching a science and you want to quickly throw up some visualizations for your students to see i could see this being a real uh, advantage and related to our next episode this was one of the motivating factors behind um the development of pluto.jl package Okay. Uh, for instructors to have quick ways to interact um, with figures for their students to see. And yeah. I, I can't wait to talk about that in the next episode. Awesome. Very cool. Well, uh, Randy, thanks. Thanks for joining me again for this. Uh, this is a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm excited to, to get this first real uh, official episode out and uh and continue with this uh this journey we've we've started on uh learning julia and sharing everything we're, we're doing with with uh, anyone that wants to, to listen to us so yeah, this is this is just awesome i, I like I, I can't wait to look back on this day like halfway <laughs> here and realize how much we've learned and how much we've talked about yeah same <laughs> it's gonna be fun all right well thanks a lot and uh, i'll see you next week yeah see you all then all right bye